Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you so much for your holy word. It would be a terrible thing to be in this world without any guidance from you. We just uh, ask that as we open your holy word and study this marvelous prophecy of Daniel 2, that your Holy Spirit will be with us and help us understand that we're living at the very last moment of time. Help us to commit our lives to Jesus fully and completely, that we might be ready for his glorious coming. And we thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to begin our study today uh, in the book of Genesis, chapter 1 and verse 28. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28. And I'm going to underline two ideas that we find in this verse, which we've underlined before, but we're going to look at this from a different perspective in our study today. Here God is creating man. And notice what he says. Verse 28. Then God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Two ideas. First of all, man was given dominion. And secondly, the territory of his dominion was everything relating to planet earth. In other words, God uh, expected uh, Adam and Eve to reproduce, to fill the earth with the holy race, and that God's kingdom would spread all across the earth. But then sin came into the world. Notice what we find in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 4. We read this before, but let's read it again. And beginning with verse 5. The devil takes Jesus to a high mountain. And I want you to notice what the devil shows Jesus. It says in verse 5, Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. You can imagine the broad sweep of human history that the devil shows Jesus. And then notice what he says in verse 6. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you, and their glory. For this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Do you notice in this passage that at this point the devil has stolen the kingdoms of this world? Because he's offering them to Jesus. And he's saying that they have been given over to him. And we understand that it was Adam that gave the kingdoms over to Satan. And so you have the kingdom going from Adam to Satan sitting on the throne and exercising dominion because the devil usurped or stole the position of Adam. In fact, the reason why Jesus came to this world was to recover the throne and to recover the territory. Jesus had to come to this world to live a life without sin. He had to gain the victory where Adam failed. And he came to this world to die for sin, to pay for all of our sins, so that Jesus could restore the throne to man and could restore the earth and the kingdoms of the world to man. And we know that Jesus gained the victory. I want you to notice what happened as a result of the victory of Christ. We find it in the Gospel of John chapter 12. The Gospel of John chapter 12. And I would like to begin reading at verse 31. John 12 and verse 31. Here Jesus says, this is by the way a couple of days before the death of Christ. He says, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Who was the ruler of the world up till this point? The devil. 
And what does Jesus say he's going to do? He's, he's saying, I am going to cast him out. In other words, he's not going to be the ruler anymore. Now what great event led Jesus to remove the kingdom, at least legally, from the hands of Satan? Not empirically, because the devil still controls most of the nations of the world. But legally, Jesus gained this earth back when he won over Satan, when he lived a life without sin, and when he paid for all the sins of the world, Jesus legally, in God's court of law, won the world back. And it's only a matter of time until he empirically and actually takes control of it. Now what event gave the world back to Jesus as the second Adam, the representative of the human race? Notice verse 32. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. So what was the event that led to the victory of Jesus over the devil, and Jesus casting out the devil as the ruler of this world, and Jesus recovering the throne of the world and this earth? It was the death of of Jesus on the cross. When Jesus said, it is finished, the kingdoms now belonged once again to Jesus. Jesus had recovered them from the hands of Satan. In fact, this is the picture that we find in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 12. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 12. And by the way, in our next lecture we're going to study Revelation 12. That will be our chapter. We'll go through it with a fine tooth comb. Now notice Revelation chapter 12 and verse 12. This is speaking about the victory of Jesus over Satan at the cross. And I'm going to read verse 10 and then I'm going to read verse 12. It says, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ has come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Now if we read this in the light of John 12, we know where he was cast down. He was cast down at the cross. And so this is the hymn that the heavenly beings are singing in consequence of what Jesus has won. They're singing, notice, the kingdom of God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before God day and night has been cast down. And then in verse 12, therefore rejoice O heavens and you who dwell in them. You see before Jesus died on the cross whenever there was a meeting in heaven the devil went as the representative from planet earth. You find that for example in the book of Job. Actually Adam should have been in that meeting but the devil went because he had taken over the kingship of the world. But now we find uh, John saying, Rejoice, O heavens, inspired by the Spirit, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has but a short time. What has angered the devil? The fact that the kingdoms of the world have now been taken over by whom? By Jesus. Now, in our lecture today, we are going to study the battle for the kingship of the world as it's been manifested from the times of the prophet Daniel to the conclusion of the great controversy between good and evil. Even though Jesus has legally gained the victory over Satan, even though Jesus in God's court of law has the title to this earth, he has won, still there are conflicts between kingdoms in this world. The devil has come down with great wrath. There still is the final battle that is going to take place where Jesus is actually empirically going to take over the rulership of this world. And we want to study the battle that has been going on between Christ and Satan in the history of the kingdoms of the world from the days of Daniel until the very end of time. Now before we get into the study of Daniel 2, which will be our key chapter, we need to say something about the great prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. They function on the basis of a method which is called, I call it anyway, the historical flow method. Basically the historical flow method teaches 
that these prophecies begin their fulfillment in the day in which the prophet was writing. And then those prophecies are fulfilled in sequence and they culminate with the setting up of Christ's everlasting kingdom. Now it's very important to realize that in between the time when the prophet wrote and when Jesus sets up his kingdom there are no gaps in the sequence. There are no parentheses. In other words there is a flow of continued events one kingdom falling the other rising that kingdom falling the other rising without any gaps in between from the days of the prophet until the second coming of Christ to set up his everlasting kingdom. This is what is called the historical method or the historical flow method. The reason I call it the historical flow method is because history flows continuously without interruptions or gaps. Now this is a beautiful way of interpreting prophecy because you can know exactly where we are in the course of history at this very moment by looking at the sequence of events that have taken place from the time that the prophet wrote. And so if you follow the line of events in Daniel 2 you can know exactly where we are now in the flow of human history. Now let's turn in our Bibles to Daniel chapter 2 and examine this story. And allow me to say that many times uh, preachers are so anxious to get to the moment of talking about the great image of Daniel chapter 2 or the great, great statue of Daniel chapter 2 that they just very briefly pass over the first half of the chapter. But there are some very important points in the first half of the chapter that I want to deal with before we talk about that great image which Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream. Now go with me to Daniel chapter 2 and verse 29 and let's notice something very interesting here. Daniel 2 and verse 29. Here Daniel says to Nebuchadnezzar, as for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this. And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. Now do you notice here that Nebuchadnezzar was thinking about the future of his kingdom when he went to bed? Let me ask you, is God able to read thoughts? How do we know he's able to read thoughts in this story? Because Daniel is saying, thoughts arose in your head about what was going to be the future of your kingdom and who knew what he was thinking? God did. And so God knowing what the king is thinking gives him a dream to answer his concern. And so we find from the beginning of the story of Daniel 2 when Nebuchadnezzar goes to bed God knows what he's thinking and God is going to answer his concerns. God is able to read the mind because Nebuchadnezzar thought this and God gave him a dream in his thoughts. Now it's interesting we're told in the story that after God gave him this dream when Nebuchadnezzar woke up he forgot the dream. Do you think it was an accident that he forgot the dream? Who do you suppose led Nebuchadnezzar to forget the dream? Well God knew what he was thinking, God gave the dream, and so now undoubtedly when Nebuchadnezzar wakes up and forgets the dream you might call this some type of divinely induced amnesia. In other words, it's God that leads him to forget his dream. And you say, why would God give him a dream and then God lead him to forget the dream? There was a very good reason. And the reason is very simple. God knew that when Nebuchadnezzar woke up, he was going to call the astrologers, the magicians, the, the individuals who claim to have communion with the gods to come and tell the king his dream and what the dream meant. Now notice Daniel chapter 2 and verse 10. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 10. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who could tell the king's matter 
Therefore no king, lord or ruler has ever asked such things of any magician, astrologer or Chaldean. Do you notice here what God is doing? God is unmasking these methods as totally incapable of revealing the dream and its meaning. In other words, the reason why God led Daniel to for, uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar to forget this dream is because he knew that Nebuchadnezzar was going to call all of these charlatans and they were not going to be able to tell the dream and in this way God would reveal that the religion of Babylon was bankrupt. Are you understanding what I'm saying? God is actually taking this opportunity to show that these methods simply do not work. By the way, we see very clearly here that the devil is not able to read the mind. Do you think the devil was dying to whisper in the ear of the astrologers and the magicians what the dream was? Oh, it was to his advantage to do it. Tell them, this is the dream. So that then they would tell the dream and people would say, see the religion of Babylon, it works. You can consult the stars. You can consult the magicians. You can consult the astrologers. Because look, they told the king his dream. But the fact is, the devil was not able to tell them the dream because the devil was not able to read Nebuchadnezzar's thoughts. Who is in control in this story? in control in this story is God. And by the way I'm not going to take the time to read Deuteronomy 18. You can do it at your leisure. It's on your list of texts. Deuteronomy 18 verses 9 through 12 has a long list of occult practices which God forbids. Among those practices is astrology, channeling, that is trying to communicate with the dead, also the idea of consulting the crystal ball, going to psychics, all of these methods are forbidden by God. In fact he says there in Deuteronomy chapter 18 that whoever practices these methods to discover what God has in store for the future is to be taken out and is to be put to death. And so these individuals were not able to tell the king his dream. In fact when the king comes and he tells these men I want you to tell me the dream and I want you to tell me the interpretation of the dream I want you to notice what they say in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 11 Daniel chapter 2 and verse 11 remember these were the individuals who claimed to be able to communicate with the gods now they're going to admit our religion is bankrupt chapter 2 and verse 11 says it is a difficult thing that the king requests and there is no other who can tell it to the king except whom? except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh in other words the gods they keep secrets they don't care about us who dwell in the flesh only the gods who don't inhabit in flesh could actually reveal these secrets now let me ask you, is this in contrast to the God of the Bible? You know there's a verse in the Gospel of John which is the exact antithesis to this. John 1 verse 14. It says the, the Word was made what? Was made flesh. The Word who was God was made flesh and dwelt with us and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Bible tells us that God is a God who communicates. He even takes human flesh to communicate God to us. What a contrast with these gods of the Babylonians. They don't dwell with flesh. They don't care to reveal what's going to happen in the future or dreams or the interpretation of dreams. What a difference between them and the God of the Bible. Now I want you to notice that there's a play and a counterplay of events here in Daniel chapter 2. When Nebuchadnezzar brings these men and they're not able to tell the king his dream, much less what the dream means, what does Nebuchadnezzar do? He commands that all of the wise men in Babylon be what? be slain. Go with me to Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 2 because there's a very important point here. Daniel chapter 2 and verses uh, 12 and 13. Daniel 2, 12 and 13. 
For this reason the king was angry and very furious and gave the command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar is saying that his religion is bankrupt. He said, you guys, what do I pay you for? I mean, you, you have no communion with the gods. Be real. Now why? Who's acting on the mind of Nebuchadnezzar to kill these wise men? It's Satan. Why? Notice verse 13. So the decree went out and they began killing the wise men and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. So what is the devil doing? He's saying, aha, you unmasked my astrologers and my magicians and you showed that the religion of Babylon is bankrupt. Okay, I'll take second best. Now I'll use your method and I'm going to have Daniel and his three friends killed. Your servants. What is the devil trying to do? He wants to destroy Daniel and his three friends. Why do you suppose he wanted to destroy Daniel and his three friends? Because in Daniel chapter 1 the devil had seen how Daniel and his three friends were faithful to God in matters of diet. And when the devil saw that they said we will not eat the food which is forbidden by God that the king serves us. We will not drink his wine. The devil says, uh oh, oh, these are a potential problem. I can't have them around. And so the devil influences Nebuchadnezzar to kill all of the wise men in the hopes that Daniel and his friends will also be what? Will also be killed. But you know God always laughs, laughs last. Because by the very act of Nebuchadnezzar sending out a decree to kill the wise men, that very act brings Daniel to prominence in the kingdom. Do you see that there's a play and counterplay of things that are happening here? You see it's like a tug of war in the background. What's happening in Daniel 2 on the level of history, on the level of events that can be seen is only a reflection of certain movements that are taking place in the invisible world between Christ and Satan. God working to save Nebuchadnezzar and save Babylon and the devil seeking to destroy. And then of course the Bible tells us that Daniel finally came before the king. And by the way we all know that text in Amos chapter 3 and verse 7, 7 where it says that surely the Lord our God will do nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants the prophets. So is God a God who reveals secrets? What did the gods of Babylon do? They concealed secrets. You see the gods of the pagans were gods that, that, that were capricious. They enjoyed partying. You know you, you, find, you read stories about them partying up there and not being concerned at all about what's happening on planet earth. But the God of the Bible is a God who wants to reveal the future. He wants to reveal His secrets. And so we notice in Daniel chapter 2, if you go with me there, Daniel chapter 2 and beginning in verse 17. Then Daniel went to his house and made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah, his companions, because he's told the king, give me some time, I'll tell you the dream. Verse 18, that they might seek mercies from God of heaven concerning this secret so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Do you see what's going on here? The devil wants to get rid of them. And then it says in verse 19, then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Do you notice here what method God used to communicate His will to Daniel? It wasn't a crystal ball. It wasn't His sign of the zodiac. It wasn't going to a psychic. It wasn't reading a crystal ball. It wasn't going to a channeler. It wasn't going to a palm reader. The Bible tells us that Daniel went directly in prayer to the God of heaven. And the God of heaven revealed the secret to Daniel. Now if Daniel had been one of those television evangelists today he probably would have taken all of the credit for this great miracle that had taken place. 
But when he goes before the king, I want you to notice what he says in Daniel chapter 2 and verses 27 and 28. Daniel chapter 2 verses 27 and 28. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days your dream and the visions of your head, of your head upon your bed were these. And then Daniel tells the king his dream. Now let's notice that dream in Daniel chapter 2 and verses 31 to 35. I want this to be very clear in our minds, the sequence that we have in Daniel 2 and verses 31 to 35. It says here in verse 31, You, O king, were watching, and behold a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. Do you notice that? Gold, silver, bronze, iron. Do you notice that the value of the metals deteriorates as you go from, the, from Daniel's day till the end? So much for the idea that history is moving towards a golden age. God would, have put, God would have put the statue upside down if that was true. But history is degenerating, shown by the devaluation of the metals. And then it says in verse 34, you watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like the chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found and the stone that struck the image became a, became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Gold, silver, bronze, iron, iron and clay, then a stone cut out from a mountain comes down, strikes the image on the feet, totally demolishes it, and the stone becomes a mountain that fills the whole earth. That was the dream that Nebuchadnezzar received. Now Daniel also gave the interpretation of the dream. That is, he not only told the king the dream, but he told him what the dream meant. By the way, the Bible teaches that God is able to tell the end from the beginning. Isaiah 46 verses 9 and 10 tells us that God knows the end from the beginning. And this is an example, a clear biblical example of God being able to predict with absolute precision events which were going to take place hundreds and thousands of years after they were written. Now let's notice the interpretation of this dream as we find it in Daniel chapter 2 and beginning at verse 37. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 37. Here comes the interpretation or the meaning of the dream. It says, You, O king, are a king of kings. Why? Because he had better armies? Because he was a wiser warrior? Because he had better weapons? Is that why Nebuchadnezzar was a king of kings? Absolutely not. Notice what it continues saying. You, O king, are a king of kings. For the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, and the birds of the heaven, He has given them into your hand, and has made you ruler over them all. Why was Nebuchadnezzar king? Because God placed him as king. In verse 21 it says that God places kings and God removes kings. So who is really in control of human history? 
who is really in control is God sitting in on his throne in a serene and calm eternity guiding the events of planet earth and then the last part of verse 38 says you are this head of gold what is the head of gold? Nebuchadnezzar now we need to understand that when it says you are the head of gold it's talking not only about Nebuchadnezzar it's talking about his kingdom because a king, a king has a kingdom and by the way that's reflected in the next verse where it says that after him would arise another kingdom see after you will arise another kingdom you can't have another kingdom unless Nebuchadnezzar unless Nebuchadnezzar had a kingdom are you following what I'm saying? and so the Lord says you or your kingdom is the head of gold now what kingdom was that? Babylon by the way Babylon existed from the year 605 BC to the year 539 BC that was the period of dominion of the Babylonian Empire so Babylon did arise and it did rule the way this prophecy says but now notice verse 39 but after you that is after Babylon shall arise another what? kingdom inferior to yours do you notice that, uh, that the devaluation of the metals does mean that uh, kingdoms are going to be inferior particularly when it comes to moral quality now notice it says once again in verse 39 but after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours now let me ask you which kingdom rose after the kingdom of Babylon? all you have to do is read history books it was the kingdom of the Medes and Persians by the way you don't even have to read history books all you have to do is read Daniel 5 Daniel 5 speaks about the handwriting on the wall when Belshazzar was king in Babylon and it very clearly says the kingdom is taken from you from Babylon and is given to the Medes and Persians all you need is Daniel you don't even have to go to history because the Medes and Persians are mentioned by name but of course history backs up what scripture says by the way the Medes and Persians ruled from the year 539 BC to the year 331 BC and then I want you to notice how this story continues it says there in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 39 once again but after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours and now notice then another a third kingdom of bronze which shall rule, rule over all the earth now let me ask you what was that third kingdom which overcame and uh, gained the victory over Medo-Persia? you read history books and it's Greece but you don't even need the history books because if you go to Daniel chapter 8 which we're not going to study in this series by the way but I've, uh, I've preached on this in other venues but in Daniel chapter 8 the Medes and Persians are mentioned by name and then the kingdom of Greece is mentioned by name as following the Medes and Persians so in Daniel chapter 2 and chapter 8 you have these three kingdoms mentioned by name Babylon, Medo-Persia and Greece there's no doubt that these are these three kingdoms the first Babylon, the second Medo-Persia and the third Greece but that's not all the story notice verse 40 it says and the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything and like iron that crushes that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others now what um, empire overcame the kingdom of Greece? it was Rome history will tell you that now Rome is not mentioned in this prophecy but by knowing that the first is Babylon, the second is Medo-Persia, and the third is Greece you know that the fourth one has to be Rome because you have a chain of powers that are being mentioned in this prophecy by the way the great historian of the Roman Empire Edward Gibbon wrote a series of volumes called The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire I have that set, I think it's probably seven or eight volumes uh, he called Rome the iron monarchy of Rome 
And those of you who have seen movies of Rome know uh, how they just totally trampled on any army that they came in contact with. And their weapons were made of iron. They destroyed mercilessly when they went to battle. And so this fourth kingdom is the kingdom of Rome. But now I want you to notice that something very interesting happens. Verse 41. Whereas as you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron the kingdom shall be divided. What kingdom shall be divided? The fourth, right? The kingdom shall be divided yet the strength of the iron shall be in it just as you saw the iron mixed with the ceramic clay. Let me ask you, does Rome continue in the feet? You tell me, does Rome continue in the feet? How do we know that? Because the legs are of iron and the iron is Rome. So if the feet have iron, Rome must what? Must continue in the feet, but how does Rome continue? In a what? in a divided state it says here in a divided state and I want you to notice that not only do you have Rome divided you know it could have been illustrated by saying the feet are also of iron and they have ten toes and that means ten kingdoms but this kingdom was going to be different than all of the other kingdoms also it was going to be divided in ten but it was going to be different because it was not composed only of iron but it was mixed with what? it was mixed with clay was it still going to be a Roman kingdom? Yes. Was it going to be a different kind of Roman kingdom? Yes. Was it going to be an amalgamated Roman kingdom? Was it going to have two substances mixed which really should not be mixed? What person in his right mind would build a house on a foundation of iron mixed with clay? There is a certain unity in Daniel 2 of the iron and the clay. But they should not exist together. They're brought together, two elements. It's a Rome that is amalgamated. The iron of Rome, the political power of Rome continues, but there's another substance which is added to the iron, which is the clay. Now what does this mixture of iron and clay represent? Well, let, let me say first of all that when, Rome, when the Roman Empire fell in the year 476, the last emperor was Romulus Augustulus. That's a mouthful. Uh, you know, he was deposed and there were no more emperors of Rome. In fact, the barbarians were invading from the northern sector of the empire. And they came and they carved up what had been the territory of the Roman Empire. And those kingdoms which they established carving up what had been Rome are the present countries in Europe. Do you know that the Roman Empire there was one language and there was one culture all over the empire but when Rome was divided now you have French and you have German and you have Spanish and you have Portuguese all of these different languages because what had been the Roman Empire was divided into ten kingdoms. Now what is this mixture of iron and clay? We're going to have to go very quickly here. Go with me to Jeremiah chapter 18. We have to allow scripture to explain scripture. Jeremiah chapter 18 and I want to read verses 1 through 6. By the way we're dealing with symbols here are we not? Let me ask you is the gold a symbol? Is it a symbol? Is the silver a symbol? Is the bronze a symbol? Is the iron a symbol? Is the stone a symbol? Is the mountain a symbol? So must the clay also be a symbol? It must represent something beyond literal clay. Now the question is, what does clay represent in scripture? So that we can understand what the mixture of iron and clay is. Jeremiah 18 verses 1 through 6. It says the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying arise and go down to the potter's house and there I will cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house and there he was making something at the wheel and the vessel that he made of clay 
was marred in the hand of the potter. By the way, did you know that in Daniel, did you notice that in Daniel chapter 2, this was not just any kind of clay, it was potter's clay? Potter's clay. So if you want to know what potter's clay means, you have to go to other passages in Scripture that speak about potter's clay. And that's what we're doing. Now, notice what it continues saying. Verse 4, And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. By the way, that represents the Babylonian captivity. When Nebuchadnezzar came and took them captive, Israel was shattered. But now notice, So he made it again into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to make. In other words, he brought Israel back to her land. I say, is this the right interpretation? Let's continue reading. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter? Says the Lord, look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. What did the potter represent in the Old Testament? It represented God's people. God's Old Testament church. Israel. Is that clear in your mind? Now, let's go to Isaiah 64 and verse 8. Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 8. This is another text which mentions uh, potter's clay. It's referring to creation. Isaiah 64 and verse 8 says this, But now, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you our potter, and all we are the work of your hand. So what is composed of clay according to this text? Our what? What's composed of clay? Our what? Our body. Right? Who formed the body out of clay? God did. He's the Father. He's the potter. We are the potter's what? Clay. And He formed us. Now go with me to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7 and notice something very interesting here. Referring to the creation of man. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. Here it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. Isaiah 64 explains that the dust was really what? It was clay. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, that is his body, and then what did God do? And he breathed into his nostrils, of that body of clay, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a what? A living soul. The body became animated. Can I, can I say it that way? So the body made of clay by the potter, God, plus the breath that goes into the body animates the members of the body so that they can all fulfill their function. Are you with me or not? And of course Israel is compared with the clay because Israel is God's spiritual body in the Old Testament. They are God's church in the Old Testament. Are you following me or not? So what is, can be said physically about man that man's body was formed out of clay, God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life can also be said of Israel because God also formed Israel, spiritually speaking, out of clay, and then God gave them what? God gave them life, so that they could function as His people, as His church. Now we have one more link that we need to take a look at, and that is in the New Testament. Go with me to Colossians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, and let's read verse 18. Colossians 1 and verse 18. Very interesting verse. It's speaking about God's New Testament church. No longer is it talking about Israel, it's talking about the New Testament church. It says there in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18 the following, And He, that is Jesus, is the head of the body, the what? The church. Who formed the church? Who formed the church? Jesus says, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. So who formed the church? Who chose the first disciples? 
Who evangelized the first people that became the nucleus of the church? Jesus did. Did Jesus form the church? Yes he did. He formed the church. But let me ask you, when he formed the church, what needed to happen so that the church could begin to function? Do you remember what happened on the day of Pentecost? They were all gathered together in one accord. Had the body all come together? Had the body been formed by Jesus? Oh yes it had. But what was lacking? The breath of life. And so what did God do on the day of Pentecost? He breathed into the church what? The Holy Spirit, the breath of life. And let me ask you, did the church now stand up in all of the parts of the body according to the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 12? Did all of the parts of the body begin to function? Absolutely! And so what does the clay represent? Tell me, what does the clay represent? It represents the church. Because as the body of man was made by clay, the church which is the body of Christ is made with spiritual clay. As man received the breath of life in order to physically live, the church received the spirit of life on the day of Pentecost. As Adam's members began functioning when his body was animated by the spirit or the breath that came from God, the church now becomes animated when it receives the breath of life on the day of Pentecost. And so the clay that formed the body of man is symbolic of spiritual clay of which Jesus formed what? The church. Are you following me or not? So let me ask you then, going back to Daniel chapter 2, what kind of Rome are we talking about here? Are we talking only about an empire, a political empire of Rome? Or are we talking about a different kind of Rome? Are we talking about a Rome that is a political power but also is mixed with the church? Are you following me or not? Is anybody alive out there? Have you received the spirit of life? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Come on, animate me folks. <laughs> Good to hear those amens. Now are you following what I'm saying? The iron is the political power of Rome. That's the fourth kingdom. But now an added element, the clay, comes into play. And the clay represents the church. Which means that after the fall of the Roman Empire, the empire was going to continue in a divided state, but it was going to be a union of what? Of church and state. Is that historically true? I want you to remember what we're studying because this is, this is the skeleton of Bible prophecy. Everything else is built on it. You know, the, the reason why there are so many jellyfish interpretations of Bible prophecy is because those interpretations have no backbone. It has no structure. This is the key prophecy. This is the backbone of prophecy. If we understand this prophecy, all of the others fit within its sequence and its structure. So there was going to be a kingdom which would unite church and state. But now we come to the best part. There's a stone. Who is that stone? Go with me to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. And let's see who that stone is, the stone that crushes and destroys, particularly those who reject it. It says in Matthew chapter 21 and verses 42 and 44, Matthew chapter 21 and verse 42, we find these words. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in your eyes. Verse 44, and whoever falls on this stone will be broken. But on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. Is that what happened in Daniel chapter 2? See, you can accept Jesus and have your heart broken or converted. And if you don't, the stone will fall upon you and crush you. That's a very strong warning that God gives in Scripture. And so who is this stone? The stone is Jesus. By the way, did you notice that, that in Daniel 2.34 it says that this stone was cut out without hands? 
What does that mean? It was cut out without hands. Go with me to Hebrews 9 verse 11. Let's notice that expression without hands. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 11. It's not speaking about the stone but it's speaking about the sanctuary and it's the same expression so we can determine what this expression means by reading Hebrews 9 and verse 11. It says here, But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle and what's the next expression? not made with hands that is not of this creation why is the stone made without hands? because it is a stone that was not made in this world it was a stone a supernatural stone that comes from the other world now the question is who is this stone? the stone is Jesus by the way did you notice that the stone is cut out of the mountain? we read that the stone is cut out of the mountain it's taken out of the mountain and then it comes and it crushes the image and I would add that afterwards the stone is taken and put back in the mountain even though the prophecy doesn't say so what is this idea of the stone being cut out of the mountain? which mountain? we need to allow scripture to interpret scripture go with me to 1st Peter chapter 2 and verse 6 1st Peter chapter 2 and verse 6 here we find an explanation of which mountain is being spoken about and what cutting out the stone means it says in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 6 therefore it is also contained in the scripture behold I lay in Zion was Zion a mountain? yes I lay in Zion a what? a chief cornerstone elect precious and, who he be, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. What did God put in Mount Zion? A precious stone. Who is that stone? It's Jesus. So what does it mean when it says that the stone will be taken out of Mount Zion and will come down and smash the image? It must be referring to the fact that Jesus is going to leave Mount Zion someday that stone, that precious stone, and he's going to come down to this earth and he's going to destroy the kingdoms of the world and he's going to establish a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Now, let's go to the climax. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44. This is what we're look, looking forward to. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44. It says here, and in the days of these kings, that is these divisions, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand how? It shall stand forever. By the way, the mountain in scripture represents a kingdom. Babylon in, in Jeremiah 51 verse 25 is called a, a mountain, a kingdom. Zion is the place where God's kingdom is found. Revelation 17 speaks about, about seven mountains which represent seven kings or kingdoms. In other words mountains represent kingdoms. So if this stone is going to come and destroy all of the kingdoms of the world and then this stone is going to become a mountain it means that it's going to become a worldwide what? a worldwide kingdom which will never be destroyed. Now I want you to notice Daniel chapter 7 and verses 26 and 27 referring also to this same fact Daniel 7 verses 26 and 27 it says but the court shall be seated and they shall take away his dominion this is talking about the little horn which comes up among the ten kingdoms we'll discuss it later on to consume and destroy forever then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people the saints of the Most High his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him that's what we're looking forward to and then of course as prophecy says the meek will inherit the earth and Jesus once again will restore the kingdom to man 
that was lost at the very beginning. And we will live in a new heavens and a new earth where righteousness dwells. Now allow me to mention some lessons from this chapter in closing. Lesson number one. The world is not spiraling out of control. God knows exactly what's happening. He has revealed the end from the beginning. Everything has happened the way He said. He's in control of human history. We have nothing to fear. By the way, if history was declared by God so long in advance, if all of the events of Daniel 2 have taken place, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, the ten divisions of Rome, the mixture of the iron and the clay, which we'll talk more about in Daniel 7, what makes you think that the last event isn't going to take place? If everything is taking place just the way God said, we know that the last event will take place. And by the way, it's very soon because we are presently living in the toenails of the image. <laughs> the toes are the last part and then Jesus will establish His everlasting kingdom where righteousness 